Hello, welcome to Outlook Africa. Outlook Africa is a social, political interview show where we discuss issues affecting Africa and the black diaspora. Today we have the honor and the privilege, and we're excited to have on our show, Dr. Umar Fatunde, previously known as Dr. Umar Johnson. Dr. Umar Fatunde is a doctor of clinical psychology. He's a certified school psychologist, and he is one of the most on-demand Pan-Africanists in the world today. Therefore, he's also known as the Prince of Pan-Africanism. Welcome to Outlook Africa, Dr. Omar Fatude. It's our extreme pleasure to have you. Um, now, with something that this is relating to your field, uh, I'll start with this question. Uh, what do you think should be the educational priorities for uh, black students, uh, given the um, the technological advancement that we have right now in the world, and also our own uh, unique needs as a community. Well, I think that one of the biggest things that's missing from the education of African children globally is a true purpose that is linked to the needs of the race, of the African family, of the community. Our children can be educated in technology, they can be educated in mathematics, they can be educated in agriculture, but what good is it if they do not have an African-centered purpose? If they do not understand that the purpose of the education is for liberation, then the education is in vain. This is why we see so many well-educated African youth go on to serve the global white power structure. Some of our greatest minds are not being used to liberate Africa or African people. They're being used to intensify the control that Europe has over Africa and African people. So we have to make sure that the foundation of the educational paradigm is based on a purpose and a purpose of African liberation. That is the main thing that I see missing from the schools that I've visited. And I've probably visited schools in, on every continent except Australia. And I do not see a very strong revolutionary Pan-Africanist foundation. Most of these schools are focused on helping our children integrate themselves in, into the white dynamic. You know, become a scientist so you can go and work for a white corporation, become an attorney so you can go and work for a white law firm. I'm not seeing enough revolutionary entrepreneurship and I'm not seeing enough pan-African purpose within the platforms of these educational institutions. They're preparing our kids for work, for military, uh, or for uh, inclusion into some European uh, institution or corporation, and, 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 and that's a failure. Ultimately, the purpose of education is to prepare the youth on how to take back power for African people. If the education is not preparing the children in the art of acquiring, protecting, and expanding power, then it is a useless education. The first thing that Black children must be taught is how to protect themselves, how to advance themselves, and how to defend themselves against their enemy. And that is not being taught. In fact, we're being taught that our oppressors are our brothers and sisters. Uh, what I'm hearing then is, um, along with the formal education, there should be uh, some kind of indoctrination program to, uh, to really uh, bring our kids into the Pan-Africanist fold. Well, it should drive the formal education. It's not separate from it, and it's not an added piece. It is the foundation of it. Everything that they learn must feed the purpose of African liberation. It's not just a mainstream education with some Black history or some African history or some African culture. We already have that in african Senate charter schools. We already have that in a lot of public schools where children are required to be taught some African history. That's useless because everything else they learn is still from a European construct. It's still from a European paradigm. So the foundation of everything that they learn, the seed from which all instruction grows must be the liberation of African people. It cannot just simply be a side dish. It must be the primary focus of the education itself. Very good. Um, let, if you piggyback on that, uh, let's look at the uh, this new movement, uh, if, I, if, I, if I may call it that, uh, the ADOS movement in the United States. Uh, ADOS stands for the uh, American Descendants of uh, Slavery. And um, 
one looks at it and um, it seems like it's just another way to divide us. Um, what's your opinion on ADOS in the first place and, uh, and why is this, why, why now? Why do we have such a, 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 a divisive uh, movement right now? Well, I think the timing suggests that it could have been an agenda of the power structure to weaken the Pan-African movement. Because as we know, the Pan-African movement is probably at its greatest height that it's been in quite some time, probably since the days of Osajifo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and of course, the most honorable Marcus Garvey before that. For this to happen at this time, the year of return, you know, a time of dual citizenship in certain African countries, a time where Africans in the East and Africans in the West are really coming together upon a solid program of Pan-Africanism, one would think that there may have been some government involvement in this cr creation of this organization, but I don't think so. And I don't think so because when I look at the individuals who are bringing it forward, I'm not going to rule it out. But when I look at the individuals who bring it forward, I just don't think the government would have wasted their time with them. I think they would have chose people who may have had a little bit more influence. But with that being said, the possibility cannot be ruled out because it has been effective. It has been effective at getting politically uneducated American Africans to disidentify from their brothers and sisters in the diaspora. So there has been some effect to it. But I don't give it a lot of energy because when I look at the history of Pan-Africanism, we've always had these anti-African movements. We've always had them. They've come and they have gone, but the red, black, and green has always you know, been consistent. My, my three biggest, the three biggest contradictions with the movement is number one, there was one slavery. There was one slavery that took Africans all over the world. Why is it necessary for you to section off your slavery? Why do you want to own that oppression? Why do you want to identify with it. So the first contradiction is how do you separate the American African slavery from all the others, especially given the fact that most enslaved Africans in America came through the Caribbean. So if you dig deep enough in your ancestry, you will find that your ancestors also came from the Caribbean because the Caribbean was the breaking ground. It was the preparation stage of the transatlantic slave trade. So most of our ancestors came through the Caribbean. So to say that a Jamaican or a Haitian or a Grenadian is not Adolf is ridiculous because if you look in your own family tree, which you might not even know because you haven't studied it enough, you'll find that you may have a Jamaican enslaved African ancestor, a Haitian enslaved African ancestor. Not only that, 20 to 40% of Africans came to the United States directly from Africa. So once again, if you're claiming you know, that you are ADOS and that African immigrants are somehow different from you. What about the fact that you may be a second or third generation descendant of a direct African immigrant? It's a total contradiction. And even when you look at culture, there is no African American culture without African culture. There is no African American culture without Caribbean culture. Because again, the antecedents of American slavery was in Africa and in the Caribbean. So where do you draw the line? You can't draw the line because you cannot piece out African DNA from African-American DNA. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I think it also speaks to the contradictions in the reparations movement as well. Namely, the fact that the reparations movement is sectionalized and it is divided as well. This should only be one reparations movement. That is my firm opinion. Okay, there can be sections to it but it should be one. There was one slavery. The fact that the CARICOM have their own and the West African states have their own and Europe has its own and America has its own, that is a recipe for disaster. And it is exactly what the white power structure wants because they will be able to play each group off of the other. They will look at the African-American demands and compare them to the Caribbean demands and say, well, how can you be asking for more than them when it was more of them enslaved? And they'll be able to play that off the African demands and say, well, if the Africans are only asking for this, how can you be asking for that? If there is no collaboration, if there is no collaboration, if there's no amalgamation 
within the reparations movement, it's going to it's going to be a disaster, a total disaster. I don't like the way it's being fought, and I think ADOS is just one of the many contradictions within the reparations front. And the biggest irony of the ADOS movement is the fact that you will not call yourself African, but you have no problem calling yourself neither a slave or an American. So it's okay to be a slave. It's okay to be an American. It's okay to be a descendant of a slave, but it's not okay to be African. It is a self-hatred movement. And when you look at the founders, one of them is of the LBGT movement, okay? And, and, the, and the other one, I specifically heard him say um, on a broadcast that African-Americans have more in common with white Americans than with Africans. I heard him say that out of his own mouth that we have more in common. And I want to quote him specifically, but I'm going to say I'm paraphrasing just for the sake of not distorting his words, but I'm 99% correct in what I heard. And he said, African-Americans have more in common with white people than we have with African people. It is a self-hate movement. It is a movement born of people who hate their Afri African roots. They hate their Africanity. They want nothing to do with Africa and they want to be accepted by white people. That's all it is. And that that's unfortunate because um... Um, even I've lived in North America for about 31 years, and I'll tell you this. Um, my observation is that even we in Africa uh, were also victimized, and we continue to be victimized in, in Africa. Um, and so in a way, you're right. The reparations shouldn't just be focused on just North America and divided across it should be a uniform demand, and that demand can come in, in, in different ways. And let me also say this too, if I may, Baba, a big issue I have with these groups, because it's more than one. ADOS is the largest, but there's others that are popping up I, I as well, I'm going to mention uh, which is I hate myself movements, which is what I call them. But yeah. the other issue that I have is they're, they're targeting the immigrant African as if the immigrant African is responsible for any of the problems that American Africans face. There are only 3 million African immigrants in America in a population of nearly 50 million American Africans. What I find so ironic about this making the African immigrant the scapegoat is these groups have not targeted the LGBTQ who have stolen more rights, privileges, and benefits from Black people than the African immigrant ever could. Yeah. And I would argue that one of the reasons they have not targeted the LBGTQ is because one of the founders is a member of the LBGTQ. They haven't dealt with them. They have not dealt with the feminists and the white woman who have also stole and siphoned and exploited the Black civil rights movement for personal gain. OK, and they haven't dealt with the immigrants of other nations who have taken far more from American Africans than the African immigrant. You haven't talked. You haven't spoken to the Mexicans. You haven't spoken to the Latinos. You haven't spoken to the white woman or the homosexual. Those groups have taken more from American Africans than the African immigrant ever could. But yet you're picking on the African immigrant. You know why? You're scared of the LBGTQ. You don't want to deal with their power. You're scared of the Hispanic. You're scared of the Mexican. And you're scared of the feminist. And since you are afraid to really go after the groups who have taken and exploited the Black struggle for personal gain, you want to pick on the lowest man on the totem pole. The United States of America don't like Black folks. They don't like them whether they came on a slave ship or whether they came in an airplane. They do not like them. It's one race. And that is not to say that there isn't tribalism practice within an African race, because there is, okay? I've been to Africa where I've heard comments that were disrespectful towards American Africans, but it doesn't bother me because I know what my mission is. I know what my birthright is. I know that I'm an African and I don't need nobody's permission to be here. So I just keep on going. See, when you're dedicated to the, to the purpose, none of this other stuff bothers you. If you know your parents left you a house, if your brothers and sisters say you can't stay in this house, you don't pay them no mind because, you know, my parents left me this house. This is mine. I don't need your permission to be here. You understand? So if you're looking for an excuse not to be African, there's a million of them. If you're looking for an excuse not to be African, there's a million of them. 
But if you're also looking for a reason to fight for the liberation of African people, there's a million of them as well. That tribalism exists on both sides. Yes, yes you have some Africans who are tribalistic in their mindset. You have African-Americans who are tribalistic in their mindset. You have Caribbean Africans who are tribalistic in their mindset. You have British Africans. That type of tribalistic mentality is not the exclusive domain of any particular group within the African family. We all have it. We all have it. So to say that African immigrants come to America, they look down on us. Okay, that's true for some. It ain't true for all. And I know that because I have many friends who live here who are from the mother continent. It's not true for everybody. But once again, if you're looking for an excuse not to be black, you can find it. Just another seed of division.